John Barnett here, and welcome to the city of Corinth. Uh, this is our second visit. As you see on the slide, we're on week 37, and we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 7. And I have to say, when I glanced at the YouTube statistics, I thought, what a challenging chapter that we're going to cover. But get your notebook. Uh, we'll need uh, much place for many notes today because this is one of the more challenging chapters uh, in the Bible and especially for uh, men. And then, of course, in your Bible, 1 Corinthians 7. And we're going to work through all of the chapter, but look at the, the key points. Basically, this is a chapter about marriage. Uh, remember last time, last week, when I introduced the book, I told you that Paul is writing back to the church at Corinth because of questions they had and problems he heard about. And so he alternates back and forth between the questions and the problems. And so they had questions about marriage. And basically there were two groups in the church. Those who felt we're supposed to serve the Lord, he's coming at any moment, shouldn't get married. Then we have the other group over here that weren't married, but were taking advantage of the easily accessible immorality that was in Corinth. So Paul talks about the problem they had understanding their sexual desires in relationship to marriage, and he reminds them of God's design. So you see what that title is. Marriage and sex as God designed them to be in 1 Corinthians 7. So remember Corinth. And whenever we're talking about Corinth, we're talking about the one church that got more chapters than any other church in the New Testament. They were special. Uh, they were special, as we saw last week, to plant a church in the shadow of, of this Apollo temple to the sun god and that Acro Corinthus you saw in the last one, to plant a church in this place of darkness and evil was a, a marvelous miracle. But, as I shared with you last time, it looked a little bit like reverse evangelism, that the people that were saints in Christ were going back to being like the pagans they were before Christ. So Corinth was vital in God's New Testament plan. He sends 29 chapters uh, of the New Testament to Corinth. And this is where we are in our year-long study. Now, remember, we're on the 37th week. Uh, it's... Uh, getting into September and uh, fall, and we hope that COVID starts waning and we're going between all the variants. But the big, big picture here is what are God's plan for biblical marriage? Now, for those of you that are just joining us, and every week, praise the Lord, I meet uh, new class members, new small group members, new friends that, that just say, like I read this morning, uh, one of you said, I was raised my whole life in the Roman Catholic Church uh, and went away from God. And when I was seeking him, among all the things I looked at at the internet, they said that they landed on, on this uh, channel and they said, I've been with you now for over a year. And this is what they said, I'll never forget. My life has completely changed. Now, you know, since, since I've never met them, it's not me that changed their life, right? Who changed their life? God. He's the one that uses his word to change all of our lives. Uh, this morning, I was sitting out as I do every morning, reading God's word, meditating on the verses that I'm memorizing. And when I got to, uh, let's see, I think I was in uh, Daniel 4.35, and it says, all the inhabitants of the earth, there is nothing. And he does according to his will among the hosts of heaven. And I was going through that in Daniel. And all of a sudden, I stopped and I said, Lord, you are watching all the hosts, the inhabitants of the earth and controlling the hosts of heaven. And you're watching me right now. And it was the most wonderful time sitting out there in the early morning dimness by the campfire that, that is outside of this place where we're staying. And I just worship the Lord. That's what God does all over the world. And through this little study, he's doing it in your lives. But this is what we're doing. I want to remind you, we're surveying the whole Bible. And for some of you, you want to understand the Bible. It's hard to understand. It's too big. Uh, maybe there are parts of it you've never understood. You're afraid. We're looking at the whole thing, the big picture, by zeroing in on 52 key passages, 
but this is what we're doing. This is not an academic class. I have taught academic classes. Academic classes are heavy in all kinds of facts and all kinds of piling it on. Everything I'm telling you is factually and true, but it is packaged devotionally. What does that mean? Right here, let's go backward. The goal of every week is to apply the Bible to our heart, to our life, to our marriage, to our family, to our work, to the students we're going to school around with, or to our fellow travelers through life. It's to apply the Bible to how we relate to people and most of all to God. That is accomplished by a prayer where we write a prayer in which we ask the Lord to unleash the truth that we've learned in the Bible this week into our life. So the goal of this is not to learn more facts, not to have verses to tell other people what they need to change in their life. It's to be a mirror to change my life. Now, how do we do that? We read the passage. 1 Corinthians 7 is our challenge this week. And we, we find, as we read it all week long, as many lessons, truths, and doctrines as we can find. Then we use our study Bible. Now, let me get the study Bible out here because this week is going to be the, the most crucial week for you because when we get done with this chapter, you're going to have so many things swirling through your mind. In your study Bible, the footnotes are tremendous, and you, you need that. Uh, this is not a, a big week for systematic theology, although that's always good, but for your MacArthur study Bible, you'll need that and use it to take notes. Why you take notes is you take what you learn and put it in your own words and find those lessons and truths and doctrines that you're going to put into that prayer and say, Lord, change me, conform me, transform me. Uh, and then, of course, we write a title. So I'll take you through this process. Now, the first thing I always do when I'm starting a chapter in the Bible is I try and figure out the context. Now, what's the context? Well, this is a letter written by Paul who was saved about three years after the crucifixion of Christ. He went off to Arabia. Remember, we covered that in Acts and we covered it last week. Uh, then he went to his hometown of Tarsus for at least seven years. Wow. Wow. Then he is discipled further by the great saints in that massive New Testament church of Antioch, which is over kind of on the border of Turkey and, and Syria, over on that kind of the, the uh, northeast corner of the Mediterranean. Then he launches off on his first missionary journey, and this is where we find him. He's ministering on his second missionary journey, writing letters to the Thessalonians, but ministering to the Corinthians. And from his third missionary journey, he writes these letters to 1st, 2nd Corinthians, and to Romans. And then, of course, we know uh, the rest of his life. We covered that last week. So see the second missionary journey. Uh, Paul starts down here in, in uh, Jerusalem. It's in the lower right-hand corner of the map there. He goes up uh, through his first missionary journey area, comes over to Philippi, Amphipolis, Thessalonica, Berea, comes around, and right there he's in Corinth, and that's where he spends about 18 months. Uh, then he goes on over here to Ephesus, and he spends about three years with them, and then uh, he goes back here to Jerusalem. And then you look here at the third missionary journey. Uh, remember, he has the extended period here in Ephesus, and a visit to Corinth, um, back through Thessalonica and Philippi, and then, of course, ends up back home here in Jerusalem. So we already covered this when we were in Acts and everything, but I wanted you to see that. But here's the purpose. Do you remember? The letter to the Corinthians, the 29 chapters to the Corinthians were because of their questions and because of their problems. Their questions were those who couldn't fully understand what the Bible said about something they were, some doctrine, some practice. The problems were those that were, didn't care what the Bible said and were going back toward paganism. Now, here's the big picture. Christ's New Testament church, so you could say this, Corinth, the church at Corinth, was born into a sin-darkened world. Remember, they were pagans. They were living like the devil, the old cliche, living like the devil. They were. Why do we say that? Well, in your Bible, and, and let me just read, in, I'll read to you John 8, 44. Before we were saved, this is what Jesus said. Key verse, 
to add to your memory list? Jesus said in John 8, you are of your father, the devil, and the lusts of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning. He doesn't stand the truth when there's, there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he's a liar and the father of it. That's how Jesus defined what we're like. Now, from the same missionary journey, let me take you over here to Ephesians 2. Look what Paul says, Ephesians 2. Got it in your, if you're new in this Bible study or if you're new in the Lord, um, John 8, 44 is the first verse I said. And the second verse I'm showing you now is Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Okay, and, and look what Paul says in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. He says, for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. So they were saved in Corinth. What were they like before they were saved? Back up to verse 1 and 2 of the same chapter. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which, in which once you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, that's the devil, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. So see, the New Testament church in Corinth was born into a sin-darkened world, basically doing what our father, the devil, wanted us to do. Because all of us were born that way. I was born that way. You were born that way. And when we were saved, we realized that, that we were totally, hopelessly bound by sin, and we cry out to Christ and ask him to save us. But when we get saved, look at this, our lives have been warped by this sin-darkened world we were born into, by our sin-darkened hearts we were born with. And that produces, look at this, mixed up marriages and confused families. And now next week, Lord willing, chapter 11 and 12 and 13, all, all that we're looking at and 14, which I've already started on, I'm so excited, um, that talks about confused families. Today, we're talking about warped lives and mixed up marriages, okay? And we'll see what God's plan is. Uh, what was God's plan for believers to live and reach out in a world so much like ours today? I would say that never in history has our world become like it was back in the Bible times. When we read about the Roman Empire and the paganism and the what the Bible calls licentiousness, what the Bible calls lasciviousness, those big Bible words that describe the darkness of pagan Romanism. I don't think there's ever been a time in history since the Roman Empire that we're more like the Roman Empire and actually almost getting worse. I know we're getting worse. Do you know why? Because the closer we get to the end, the darker it's getting. So what is God's plan for us? How do we live in the dark world that's so much like the Bible world? And how do we reach out to other people around us that, that are totally enslaved to fear? They're totally enslaved to, to living a broken life. And they, they think that's just... Well, I hear people say it all the time, don't you? Well, that's just the way I am. I listen to that and I say, but that's not the way you have to be. Because I know just the way I was. But what a wonderful change in my heart and life and mind Christ has made. See, whenever you see someone lamenting the, the problems in their own life, their own weaknesses and struggles and 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 disability spiritually and emotionally and relationally with others. And every time they lament about their marriage or their relationship or their family, you can say, boy, I understand. But guess what? God says a new heart also I will give you. Oh, let me write that one down for you. Ezekiel, the book of Ezekiel in the Old Testament, chapter 36, verses 26 and 27. Whenever I quote a verse, it's one of my favorites. And you know why I quote them? I went through them this morning. My, I have four different uh, groups of verses that I alternate. Every day I go through a different pack. This morning, 
are the 127 Bible doctrine verses. I, I learned them with my wonderful wife. She's sitting over there uh, running the, the Switcher studio. Thank you, wonderful. Um, but Bonnie and I, when we were in Bible school, both learned these 127 verses. Did you know I review those every fourth day, all 127 of them? That's one of them right there. A new heart also will I give you, a new spirit I'll put within you. I'll take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a soft heart, and you will keep my commandments and do them. That's God's promise. So God wants us to reach out to a world that's just like the Roman culture, and this is what he wants us to do. And, and now jump over to my Bible, okay? I want to go through the whole seventh chapter with you. Now, you notice, you know, I always am marking my Bible. I encourage you, uh, you can get, and down in the description of this video, there is a description of this Bible. It's, it's a $19 or $20 Bible. Now, probably they're going to raise the price because inflation is surging all over the world. But th what you see right here is just a plain $20 Bible. What I like about it, first of all, it's a New King James Version because that's the version that blends the, the manuscripts that are most used by the early church and the early church fathers with the scholarship that came about uh, during the Reformation time. When those two are merged together, it's the New King James. Now, I also love the English Standard Version. I love the New American Standard for the Hebrew Old Testament. I love the NIV. So all of those, you know, um, ESV, NAS, NKJV, of course, King James, many people love that. And for the Old Testament, the NIV are all very good translations. Now, over here, um, this is what Paul says, principles of marriage, do you see that? Now that is just something the Bible publisher put in as little headers for the different sections of each chapter. Those aren't inspired, but they're helpful. And when they're helpful, I circle them. See. Uh, principles of marriage, keep your marriage vows, live as you were called to the unmarried and to the widows, be sensitive to your conscience, all these things. I circle them so I kind of see some of the subjects there. But look what he says, concerning the things which you wrote to me. Do you remember what the book of Corinthians is about? Their questions. That's what they wrote to him. So isn't that interesting? We're seeing Paul responding on the second missionary journey to I mean, on the third missionary journey, to questions from his second missionary journey. Those, all those maps I showed you in charts are to show you the context of this. He's already been there. He's already invested 18 months of his life. And now they have all these questions. Have you ever gone to a, a church service or a, a conference and you've heard a message and the longer you thought about it, you went, oh, I have all these questions. That's what it was like back then. Only they wrote to Paul. And Paul's answers back to them are inspired holy scriptures. Do you remember when inspiration is? It's when the Spirit of God breathed out this book through human instruments. And Paul was one of them. So, your questions that you wrote to me about. And it's good for man not to touch a woman. You say, well, what is this? Like tag? Don't touch? You know, like touch? No. In the culture, in the context, in the time period that we are talking about, this was not bumping into someone in the subway or, you know, on the race course. It was a euphemism to touch a woman always in the New Testament world was a sexual connotation. So what he's saying is it's not good to be sexually involved with women. And that was their question. What is the role of sex in my life, in marriage, in ministry? Where does it fit? Now that, that's a challenging question, especially in the culture where we live, where uh, Gallup and Barna and the U.S. Census has even found out that, that the majority of people in America who call themselves Christians do not believe it's wrong to live together, to have sexual relationships with people you're not married to. I mean, look at the college campuses of America and all that goes on. So what is so they had the same questions that are facing us today. So what does Paul say? 
It's good for men not to touch a woman because of sexual immorality. That's when you do touch her. When you are involved sexually, it's called sexual immorality. Let's each have our own wife and let each man, uh, each woman have her own husband. So he starts talking through, let the husband render to his wife. And then verse four, the wife doesn't have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority of his own body. What he's saying is, that the sanctifying relationship of marriage is what God uses to keep sexual desires in the banks of the river that they're supposed to be. You say, what did you just say? What I said is this. God says, and this chapter tells us, some people have the gift of singleness. And if they have it, they know it. They know that they are called to so focus on something for the Lord they are single. They could be married, but they do not want to be married. Uh, they do see marriage and they see all the blessings of it and they think it's wonderful, but they believe for God's calling for them. They're not to be married. That's the gift of singleness. Did you know the rest, God says, so that you avoid sexual immorality, you should get married? Now, Boy, is that difficult for me to say, since in our culture, young people are waiting longer and longer and longer and never getting married, but they are sexually active from their teenage years. What does that do? It makes them feel empty. It makes them feel guilty. It makes them feel far from God. It makes them slowly desensitized to the Holy Spirit. It makes them very much unable to understand the Bible because the only way to understand this book is to have the Holy Spirit filling us. And you cannot be filled with the Holy Spirit and living in sexual immorality, which is having any sexual fulfillment outside of marriage. That's what this chapter says. Okay. Back to the chapter. And do not deprive one another, that sexually, except by consent for a time. He's talking to married people here. When you give yourselves to fasting and prayer and then come together again so Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control, part of the ministry for a couple, for powerful prayer, is for them to make a conscious choice as a couple that for a, a brief period of time, they are going to fast and pray. Notice what he said, fasting and prayer right there in verse five. They're going to fast and pray. And, and part of their fasting is fasting from the joy, the delights, the, the unifying super glue power of the marital sexual relationship. And they fast from that and even from food or coffee or whatever they fast from so that they can focus on prayer. But you know what it says? But come together again, so Satan doesn't get an advantage. Now, now notice what he says. Uh, to, the, to the married, well, I'll start here. Uh, verse eight, but I say to the unmarried, see that, I circled it. Then look at verse 10, I say to the married, and then look at this, verse 25, now concerning the virgins. There are three groups here. Everybody in the church is either unmarried, married, or virgins. What are virgins? Virgins are people, like the term virgin means, who have never had any sexual involvement with anyone. That's a virgin. Who, who are the married? The people that are married. Who are the unmarried? Those are the people whose spouse, partner, husband, or wife has died. They're they have been widowed or divorced. So this chapter is huge. This talks about divorce, marriage, singleness, and living a pure, holy life without sexual immorality. What, what an amazing chapter. Uh, and especially, you can see in verse 27, he starts talking about uh, divorce and remarriage. So that's my Bible. Now look back at the slides. So, I just took you around my Bible and how I mark it. Now let's go into my journal. Now this, remember, this is my journal, but I've typed out, I'll show you, for those who've never seen it, uh, on our Facebook page, these, these instructions, you can, they're, they're down in the pictures, you know, it's a picture document. You can download that 
print it off. It's also on our website, uh, discoverthebook.org. And I've put in there the how to do this study and all the chapters we're covering. Then I also have taken, let me get to our chapter, 1 Corinthians 7. Um, I've also written, you know, the 1 Corinthians 7, the title and the, sum, the summary and all the lessons, but I've typed them out for you. So here they are in the next slide. Uh, this is week 37. We're covering 1 Corinthians 7. God's design for sex, marriage, contentment, and divorce. Now remember, every time I read this chapter through, I just get a little different idea of the title. So you can see there's, there's such a difference between all these titles, but they're all kind of focused around the same topics. Now, let me give you the summary. And I typed all this out. Christ Church was born into a sin-warped, sin-darkened world of mixed-up marriages, sin-scarred lives, and confused families. But men and women who were gloriously saved, like the Corinthians, did not automatically become great wives and mothers or husbands and fathers. Getting saved doesn't make you instantly perfectly living the life of Christ. All it does is give you a brand new operating system that you have to make little tiny daily choices to look in the mirror and say, God, where am I not obe obedient to your word? And I ask you to change me. That process, do you remember, is called sanctification. That is God taking his word, sanctification. And the key verse in it is John 17, 17. And this is what that verse says. Another one of those Bible doctrine verses I was working on this morning. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. This is what changes the way I think, the way I talk, what I look at, what I listen to, what I get involved in, what I do when I'm online in the digital world. This book, The Truth of God, transforms everything, okay? Now, remember I told you how important your MacArthur Study Bible is going to be? These next few slides I'm going to show you, I actually took a picture. That's right out of my MacArthur Study Bible. I took a picture of it and show you my highlighting, okay? Verse 2. There is a great danger of sexual sin when single. And so John MacArthur cites right there Matthew 19, 12. Look at this. Marriage is God's only provision for sexual fulfillment. Marriage is God's only provision for sexual fulfillment. Marriage is God's only provision for sexual fulfillment. That's why the disciples, <laughs> they said, wow. They said, this is too hard. Remember in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, you cannot look at a woman and desire for her sexually without committing adultery, and adulterers have no place in the kingdom of God. Their place, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, says, your place for an adulterer, Paul said, under the authority of Christ, is endless, painful punishment in hell. Jesus, Jesus was very clear. The sexual desire that God designed within us is a test for whether we are going to submit to God, follow his plan, which, by the way, is the best way possible to live, the most wonderful way to live. Uh, it, it, earlier, do you remember when we were going through Proverbs? Do you remember that embarrassing when I was talking about in Proverbs about God saying that marital sexual relationship is like, like being um, intoxicated with the love of your partner and, and all the descriptions that are so embarrassing to read about marital love? That's God's plan. But look at this. Marriage is God's only provision Marriage should not be reduced simply to sexual purposes. God has a higher view, and we're going to see that in a moment. But what he's stressing here is the issue of sexual sin for people who are single. And that's what mobile devices have done. About 80% of pornography is consumed on mobile devices. And 
a vast amount of that is consumed by males. Now, a growing percent by females. The pornification of our society is growing, but that is God's warning. Okay, so let's go back to the Corinthians. When they came to Christ, they were forgiven. And by the way, God forgives us. If you have called the name of the Lord and been saved, he has forgiven you and me of all of our sins, past, before we came to Christ, present, that's all of our struggles today, and future to the last moment that we're living and breathing on earth. So, no matter how great you're struggling this moment with, with online defilement or with just fear. Did you know that's a sin? Fear, living in constant fear, anxiety, bitterness, an unforgiving spirit, covetousness, you know, walking through the mall and being upset you can't have everything you see, uh, rivalry, jealousy, all of those things are sin. But some sins are more debilitating than others. Sexual sins are, the Lord says, sexual sins unite Christ to that sin because he lives in our body. We are his temple. Paul said all other sins are outside the body, but sexual sin is joining the body to perform something God says is sinful. And that is totally grieves the Holy Spirit. So I don't, I'm preaching to the choir, actually. All of you know that struggle with any form of sexual temptation, that immediately you don't feel like reading the Bible, immediately you don't feel like praying, immediately you feel so far from God, immediately you feel totally just internally struggling and, and grieved, and that's what the Holy Spirit is quenched. But remember, the instant that we... No matter how far we go away from the Lord, it's one step back. I've said that probably 50 times in our study so far. So the instant we say, Lord, I was wrong, I'm sorry, please forgive me, cleanse me, and repent. Remember, repentance is a change of mind that leads to a change of behavior. The instant we do that, God graciously uh, forgives us and gives us everything we need, again, to become godly wives and mothers and husbands and fathers. But guess what? And that's what 1 Corinthians 7 is about. We need something else. We need to be around other believers who help teach us how to believe the truth of God correctly and then a small group discipleship time to learn how to behave correctly. See, if you believe right, you can behave right. That's why it's so important for you not to be struggling and trying to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts all by yourself. You need someone else where you say, God has convicted me and I want you. That's why... I want you to help me. That's why my original 52 chapter study, we had a texting um, kind of choice we made, an agreement between all the members of the group that once a day we would send out a text. And what we would say is yes, no, or, you know, help. And so yes means I'm in the word, I'm struggling against sin, I'm not. We ask each other once a week, have you consciously exposed yourself intentionally to wicked things online. We would ask personally out, out around the group and we would either say yes, no, or I'm struggling. Now the ones that said yes, they didn't stay very long because they didn't want, they'd say, yeah, I do. And that's just how I am. They didn't want Christ to change him. The ones that said I'm struggling, they didn't want to be that way. So what we did is we set up the texting, and if someone said, I'm struggling, we immediately called them and said, hey, you, you know, I'll come over. I'll, what do you need? What's going on? Don't give in to the lust of the flesh or whatever. Some of them, it isn't always pornography. It can be anything. Some people struggle with taking things and stealing and lying and, and whatever, jealousy, bitterness. But how to behave correctly, if you believe right, you'll behave right. And you need someone to look you in the eye and say, come on, you know better than that. Deny ungodliness. These new believers needed coaching, training, modeling, and encouraging in a one-on-one -on -one relationship. So I would encourage you, and I'll say this at the end, find someone to share what you're finding in your journal and that prayer and, and show them what the scriptures say and then tell them, this is what I want God to do and will you ask me next week? 
what progress I've made. Godly behavior is a series of choices. And those men and women had to be nurtured in the daily skills that would lead to victory, to loving marriages and families. So prompted by God, or, or so God prompted Paul to write some words that can reach across the centuries. What we're reading in 1 Corinthians 7 can revitalize any marriage, any family, any home, any life. The key is found the call not only for spirit-prompted agape love, that sacrificial love that's within the heart of all of us who've been saved, but God wanted each marriage to have this friendship love. You know, that's why a lot of young men are not married yet. A lot of young women are not married. They've never been able to become friends with a fellow believer on a spiritual level without getting that physical uh, relationship engaged. And they haven't fallen in love as best friends. That love of friendship where, where you want to be together, not because you're going to be all over each other, but because you love them emotionally and mentally and spiritually and you love them the way they talk and the way they laugh and you love everything about them. And then the super glue to that is the sexual dimension. Do you know what's going on in our world today? People are super gluing themselves and then tearing it apart and super gluing themselves to someone else. And they're wearying themselves with what God made to be the super glue of marriage, not just to have fun. And they're grieved and quenched and feel empty. Okay. Um, and so the goal is to share life with your husband or wife. The love that glues husbands to their wives is a love that is chosen and modeled and a love that can be learned. That's what this chapter is about. Okay, let me take you through everything I personally found. In verse 1, Paul explains the power of sexual attraction. It's so powerful, we need to be very careful. At verses 2 to 4, mutual loving companionship is God's plan with mutual submission to one another. Uh, we're not just to show physical affection is to bribe one another. Remember, some of those people in Corinth were so spiritual, they decided they wanted to have separate bedrooms and that sex was, you know, not spiritual and they were going to go off and just, you know, serve the Lord and they left their partner, you know, in the dark and, you know, and abandoned them. That's what was going on in Corinth. Can you believe it? Well, that's what Paul addresses in verse 5. In verses 6 through 9, Paul said, I'm gifted with singleness, not wanting to be married. But he says, most people are not. So what he said is, there's nothing wrong with saying, I need to be married. I want to be married. I'm, I need that partnership and companionship and love and that sexual relationship. There's nothing wrong with that. Paul said, singleness and marriage are both equally high in God's calling. But he said, few are called to be single like I am, Paul said. Most of you are going to be married. Then in verse 8, 10, and 25, Paul describes those three states of believers, the unmarried, who are the divorced and widowed, the married, and then the virgins, who were never married. Um, then in verses 10 through 16, he talks about what happens if you have an unbelieving partner. Now remember, in the uh, study notes, all of this is deeply covered, and I can't take our whole time to read those notes to you or to rehearse them. So you'll have to do, remember, part of our assignment is to read the chapter plus one time go all the way through the study notes in your study Bible. That's the equivalent of a Bible college education. So don't forget to do that part, especially this week. If wed to a lost person, a pagan, the sanctifying power touches the marriage even down to the children. That's very important. What Paul says if you're a married woman, have an unsaved husband, or you're a married man, have an unsaved wife, stay married as long as that unsaved person will stick with you because your marriage will be sanctifying to them. They'll keep seeing Christ in you. Plus, if you have children, it, there is a supernatural protection and work on those children that God grants in an unequally yoked marriage where there's a believing partner, an unbelieving partner. Um, wow. Wow. There's this whole contentment issue in 17 to 24. And then Paul says to be undistracted in ministry, uh, you, you stay single if you're called to it. But if you're married, your priority is for your partner. See, we have a lot of problems with that today. And that's 
harming the church. If you're married, your husband or wife is your highest priority above your ministry. Some people act like their ministry in the church is more important than their wife or family. It's not. Your wife and family are more important than your ministry. Not the Lord. He's most important. But how you serve him in the local church is not higher priority than your wife and or husband, your marriage and your family. So that's what 25 to 40 is about. Okay, another note from the MacArthur Study Bible. Look at verse 15. This is about divorce. And this is what Paul says, let them depart. A term referring to divorce. When an unbelieving spouse can't tolerate their partner's faith and want a divorce, it's best to let that happen in order to preserve peace in the family. Now look at this. The bond of marriage is broken only by three reasons. One, death. Two, adultery. Or three, an unbeliever leaving. Now what does this mean? Now see, this is a lot of study this week. This is going to transform a lot of your understanding. You're going to see a controversial area and be able to, from the scripture, come to a very clear conviction of what the Bible says. Not under bondage. When the bond of marriage is broken, how does it break? Death, sexual immorality, adultery, or desertion, the unbeliever departing. A Christian is free to marry another believer. Have you ever had anybody say, if you're divorced, can you get remarried? Mm -hmm. If your partner left you or committed adultery. But what if they didn't? See, that's the challenge. And that's what this chapter, that's what you have to spend this week reading. Because Paul, all the way through 1 Corinthians 7, explains what God's plan is for you in marriage, even when it's hard. Okay? So that's that note. You can read it. So to repeat, there are only three biblical allowances for marriages to dissolve. Death, adultery, desertion. And here's where each of them are described. Now here's another note. Discontent was prevalent among the new believers in the Corinthian church. Some wanted to change their marital status. They found someone nicer in the church that, you know, their wife was married, but they didn't think she was as pretty or whatever. Discontentment. Some were slaves. They wanted to be free. Some used their freedom as a rationalized for sinning, going back to the old. In general response, this pa passage repeats the basic principle that Christians should be willing to accept their marital condition and their social situation, which God placed them, and content to serve him there. Contentment. Wow. What is that? Well, discontentment's very dangerous. Paul said, I've learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. And then look at, at 1 Timothy 6. Here, let me get to 1 Timothy 6 in my Bible. And, uh, well, let me do it over here so you can see it too. 1 Timothy chapter 6, starting in verse 6. Um, 1 Timothy 6, 6. Now godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world. It's certain we can carry nothing out. Having food and clothing with these be content. What is, what's dangerous? Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, a snare, into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction, the love of money. Do you see all this discontentment? But look at verse 11. You, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Uh, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you're called. Wow. Paul says, back to the slide, discontentment, very dangerous. It's deadly to a marriage. We are supposed to love the one that God gives us and, and merge our life more with them every day. Okay, uh, here's the last section that talks about uh, marriage and singleness. That's, a, uh, that's actually one of the studied, um, study Bible notes, and you can read that. I want to conclude with this, and I'm going to go through this very rapidly, but it, I've been talking so much about, you know, singleness and, and that there's no sexual fulfillment outside of marriage, but I haven't talked much about marriage as God designed it. So here's God's plan. He's always had from Genesis chapter 2 on. This is what he wants the world to see is marriage as he designed it to be. And here's a chapter 
that sadly we don't get to cover. So I'm just going to briefly survey it. It's not one of the 52. Next time I change the chart, I'm going to add it. Okay. God designed marriage as one of the most publicly displayed uh, elements of his plan for the world to see. Married people are to go out and live in a dark and hopeless world that's chasing after elusive pleasures and never finding them and radiate Christ through their marriage. That's, that's actually God's plan. How does that work? Well, God wants husbands who reflect Christ's love for his church. How do you do that? Well, how does Christ love the church? He loves us every day. He sacrifices for us, cleanses us, affirms us, nurtures us, protects, pursues, and never gives up on us. That's Christ for us. That's what Christ wants husbands to do for their wives. God desires wives who reflect back the love that the church is supposed to have for Christ back to their husbands. What, what is that love that the church is supposed to have for Christ? Well, as a member of Christ's body, I want to follow Christ, honor Christ, respond to Christ, enjoy Christ's presence, follow Christ's lead, feel Christ's love, seek time every day with Christ, and love Christ's plan. And you know what Jesus said? Wives, you're supposed to love your husband in the same way as the church responds to Christ. So wives are to follow their husbands in every way that they're following Christ, honor their husbands when they're honoring Christ, respond to their husbands when their husband is, is trying to lead in a Christ-like way. Do you understand what I mean? It's the same way that the church responds to Christ as the way wives are supposed to respond to their husbands. You say, well, my husband is not Christ-like. And that's the challenge. The challenge is husbands are not Christ-like and wives are not acting like the church responding to Christ. So how do we change that? That's what Paul wrote the book of Corinthians about. He says, marriage is the second greatest day of your life. The first greatest day is when you got saved. And so he said, we each are responsible to be in Ephesians 5, husband or wife. So watching this YouTube video, 70% uh, of you are men and 30% of you are women. Okay, to the 70% over here, this is what God wants you to do. I'm going to go through each one of these. For the 30% of you that are women, this is what God wants you to do. And I'm going to go through those with you, okay? Uh, verse 25 of Ephesians 5, right here. Husbands, love your wives. God wants all husbands to sacrificially love their wife. How do you do that? One of the most touching moments Bonnie and I have ever had. We were in uh, a South American capital city doing a conference for missionaries. And I was doing this through a translator in Spanish. And I asked this group of pastors who were church planners if they would reaffirm Ephesians 5 to their wife. There was a gasp. The translator in English leaned over to me and said, in this culture, men don't say things like that to their wives. I said, yeah, but they're in a new culture. They're Christ's new operating system. So it doesn't matter what their, their, their culture that they grew up in and their ethnic culture is. This is what God said. And the, there was a long pause, and the, the audience wondered what we were talking about because we were talking in English. 250 of them. And the translator said, they're not going to do it. I said, but I'm just going to tell them what God says they're supposed to do, and they can make a choice. And so he said, okay. So I went like this. And all 250 of them stood up. And then I said, face each other. See, you can communicate without speaking. And so all the couples faced each other. It was all married couples, all believers. I said, let's reaffirm out loud, starting with the husbands, what God wants you to do as a godly Christian leader. And I, I said, repeat after me, say to your wife, I want to love you as my wife and give myself to you today. And the translator closed his eyes and kind of winced and then said that in Spanish. And there was a silence. And then you could hear a murmur. 
Here's the end of the story. Do you know what happened? As we went through these one by one, and they, husbands, said this to their wives, you could see all over the audience, even from the platform, the, the shiny line of tears running down faces. On the break, Bonnie had a whole group of these women come and say to her, my husband has never said anything like that to me in 25 years of marriage. God transformed a lot of hearts. Be sacrificial. Number two, God wants obedient husbands. I want to love you with the same devotion Christ has for me as his church. See what it says in verse 25. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Obedient husbands. God wants word-filled men who are husbands. I want to spend time in the word and prayer so our marriage is sanctified and cleansed each day. See verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. By the way, some of you might say, I'd like, to, I'd like to see that card you're reading from. It's right there at our website, discoverthebook.org. It's, it's in the resource section. And you can download it. it. It fits right into your wallet. It's a credit card size wallet. I mean, card that's wallet size. Uh, <laughs> it's credit card size to fit in your wallet or purse. There we go. And you can download it and uh, use that and print it off. God wants word-filled husbands. He wants devoted husbands. Do you see what it says in verse 27? It says uh, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle, but that she should be holy and without uh, blemish. I want you to be all that God has gifted and called and prepared you to be, and I'm going to work alongside you for that goal. See, that's what makes husbands and wives such best friends. The husband's not just concerned about his career, his plans, his. He says, I want you to be all that God gifted and called and has prepared for you to be. I'm devoted to that. And I want to be a Christ-reflecting husband. I want to love you, care for you, nourish you, cherish you. I want to serve you in the same way that I care for my own body and its needs. Do you see what it says in verse 28? The husband ought to love their own wife as their own body. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his flesh but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. Christ reflecting husbands. Uh, whoop. Next one. Consecrated husbands. I want to leave anything that hinders me from fulfilling this calling from God to be your husband. Look what verse 30 says. For we are members of his body, his flesh and bone. For this reason, a man shall leave anything. It says, father, mother, be joined as wife in two, one. But what it's, he is leaving the buddies, the old, the old things that used to fill his life, his time, his hobbies and all of his things. I want to leave anything that hinders me. Did you know that's at the heart of so many marriage problems? Two people living two separate lives, not merging their lives. And the merging starts with husbands being willing to leave anything that hinders him him from his calling. You know what it might be? Gaming. Leaving gaming. Leaving all the time that's the, the spent with stuff that really doesn't matter forever. Focused. Look at verse 31. Um, it says, leave father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one. I want to be closer and closer to you the longer we live. That's the essence of a godly marriage. And I want to be dedicated. I commit to love you this way. It's the way God designed marriage to be. I need your help, and I want you to encourage me, even when I'm not doing as well as I should be. That's when your husband isn't treating you Christ like you encourage them. Where does it say that? Look at verse 33. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his wife as himself. And look, let the wife see she respects her husband. I want you to encourage me, wife even when I'm not doing as well. Did you know, many times husbands try, and when they're not trying hard enough or doing enough, one criticism about, oh, uh, from the wife, pops. You know, men can be deflated so easily. Wives, I would encourage you, get that card, go through this, husbands to your wife and wives to your husbands, We'll never finish unless I do the application prayer. So this, after this whole 
week in 1 Corinthians 7. This is what I wrote. I want to pray it now. Lord, teach me how to love Bonnie as you love me. I want to be her best friend. I want to be closest of all on earth to her. I want to love her as you, my Savior, love me. Help me not to allow Satan a place to tempt me. You know how it says, don't give place to the devil. I don't want to allow him a place. Teach me this contentment. It's a learned choice in my life and marriage. So I can show others how to follow your way by my example. In Jesus' name, amen. Can you imagine a group, in a small group, praying that? And then saying, I want you to hold me accountable. I want you to tell me whether I'm treating my husband or my wife more in a Christ-like manner than you've known or seen me in the past. Do you see how God transformed the Corinthians? Do you see how he wants to transform us? So, two challenges. Find someone you can share your findings with this week in your application prayer. And then pray for us. We're right now going through the challenge of 10 weeks serving the Lord in Europe and the Pacific Rim. 10 weeks. And you know, I mean, all that's going on with travel and and the the regulations and the vaccines and the, the borders, we're crossing six international borders. So pray for us. So my challenge to you is have an amazing week in 1 Corinthians 7. And then find someone to share it with. And then, Lord willing, next week, 1 Corinthians 11, 12, 13, 14. The Lord's Supper, spiritual gifts, divine love, and all that God has to say about order in the church, and then getting to chapter 15 with celestial bodies and the return of Christ. I mean, we're going to have an amazing time, Lord willing. Till then, God bless you as you study. Can't wait to be back with you next week.